guys and welcome to this week's lesson. This week we're going to be learning about a very specific bit of Chinese art. Today we're going to learn about the golden age of Chinese ceramics, which is from the Song Dynasty until the Ming Dynasty. Mostly the Song Dynasty though, those were the really cool guys. And so without further ado, let's begin. All right, ceramics from Song to Ming. Here we go. So let's get started. So, right, we're going to start off with the Song Dynasty. So the Song Dynasty was from 960 years to 1,279 years. Um, so I'm getting, sorry, I'm not very good at saying dates, but I'll do my best today. So 960 is the 10th century. So what's happening in the 10th century around the world? Let's give us a bit of context. So while the Song Dynasty, so the Song Dynasty is one of the biggest and most um, culturally um, exciting periods in Chinese history. You know, they've got a big imperial court, they're doing really well, they're churning out some fabulous art and painting. Um, meanwhile, in Europe, it is the middle, middle, middle of the Middle Ages and we're not up to much, um, not much is happening, um, there's not much writing, that sort of thing. Um, in the Islamic world and the Byzantine Emperor, they're also flourishing culturally. So that's kind of giving you a bit of global context of what's happening. So 10th century, not much is happening in Europe. So Song Dynasty is, is still very, very, very popular today. It's seen as the foremost expression of ceramics in the world. So like it's the best, it's seen as the creme de la creme of ceramics people still look back at it and they're like whoa that was really good what is it about some ceramics that people love the forms and colors are really simple subtle and elegant so it's super tasteful it's very thin it's very fine it's very muted colors you could almost say minimalist kind of before minimalism was invented the key word here is also elegance so all the design elements are in harmony. So you're, if you're seeing all these kind of pieces along the bottom, that's different types of Song Dynasty. I stole this picture from the Christie's website. So, you know, it's very nice, very antique. Um, and if you look at all these pieces, they're very harmonious. There's no bits that are sticking out that are quite jarring. Everything's kind of in its place and looking really nice. Also, one thing to notice is the glazes. So the glazes are the the kind of the molten glass that's covering the surface of the clay are very fluid and although they look one colour they actually offer great depth of colour close up. So we'll see a bit more about that when we actually look at some examples. The thing to remember is glaze is, a is applied in the and then it's put in the kiln and it's heated up and when it's heated up all the particles become, become like molten glass um, so everything's kind of moving around and forming a nice layer um, so it just it's when this comes out and it's cooled down and it hardens and for, attaches to the surface of the clay um, it's still kind of got that fluidity it's not completely uniform there's interesting effects happening in there so in the Song Dynasty the, um, the emperor um, would find different kilns so people making ceramics kiln is the oven that ceramics are made in um, and he would be like, you're an imperial kiln and you're gonna make stuff for me and only me. And each of these kilns and each of these potters would only make one type of ceramics and that's how they got really, really, really good at it. So they were only making one thing, they weren't multitasking, they were doing one thing and they were doing it really, really well. So throughout the Song Dynasty, they had five great imperial kilns. So these were the really, really good ones. And that's what we're gonna look at first off. So first off, we're looking at dingware. So this is a close-up of a dingware plate. So just have we think, what are you seeing there? What am I, what am I showing you? It's very subtle, isn't it? We're seeing that subtlety. Definitely, it looks like there's a pattern kind of incised there. So let's have a wee learn about dingware. So dingware was actually made from the Tang to the Ming Dynasty. So that's actually over a very, very, very long time. So that's maybe about seven century to about 14th century so you know it's a very long time but it was at its absolute peak during the Song Dynasty so that's when it was really 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 good essentially 
So what is it? What are we looking at? So this is a very, very thin porcelain plate. And it's very, it's white or almost gray. And it's covered in a transparent white tinted glaze. So we're all about these whites. It's all very calming, subtle, it's all very thin and fine. And it's mostly decorated with uncolored designs that are incised. Now, what does incised mean? Incised means cut in. So all these little bits are carved into the plate. So you've already got this really thin plate and then you're carving into it, making it even finer. So it's a very, very shallow relief. So it's kind of 3D. If you touched it, you'd be able to feel the pattern. So very, very, very subtle, very fancy. So it's carved in this beautiful way, but it's also understated because they're not using garish colors. So it's kind of got this fine ornamentation without being gaudy. Ding, another dingware plate here. It's got these lovely incised patterns, some lovely flowers, very, very ornate. And then I know I said that um, the kilns only produced one thing, but I'm going to contradict myself here. These kilns also produced some very rare pieces with black and white oil spotting. And here they are. So quite a contrast there from the white to the black. Um, and this type of glaze is very hard to do. Um, you need very specific um, kiln environment, you need the right temperature, you need the right temperature for the right time, you need the right amount of oxygen in it. And it creates these gorgeous splatters in which are iron in the glaze. Um, and I, I just think it looks like you're flying through a galaxy. I think they're really, really nice. And again, very, very simple forms. We've got a very shallow dish here. We've got this subtly indented edge. Lovely. So now we're going to look at some June ware. So June is the second of the Imperial Kilns. We'll have a look at this. What are, we, what are we seeing here? We've got some lovely sky blues. We've got some purples. We've got some of the clay body showing through here where it's kind of coming through the glaze on the edges. Very nice, quite swirly. So June ware was again um, from the 10th century. They were widely made, but then the finest ones were made specifically for the court. And they, you had quite a wide variety of glazes. You get blue-grey, sky blue, moon white, which I think is one of my favourite descriptors for white. Moon white, it's very nice. Red and purple. And the most prized ones had these lovely purple or even red splatters on them. And kind of one of the things you'll notice about them is that decoration is splashed, streaked, or wormed on, which is again a very good adjective. So you might look at this and think, oh, I just splashed it on. And it, that kind of effortless, actually, <laughs> effortlessness actually takes a lot of effort to do. Um, so it might look like it's just kind of been like splattered on, a bit like abstract art, you know, my five rule could do this. But actually, in, in reality, it's taken a lot of precision and practice to get that splash just right. Yeah, these shapes are often a bit thicker than other song ceramics, um, but they, they still look really good, don't they? I think, again, you've got this lovely, very minimal shape, just a slight flaring at the top, this lovely round bulb. Again, no handles, it's not very fussy. The main, the main thing is this lovely glaze. Here's another one as well. Again, very lovely, simple shape. Just got these nice kind of dimples in here to kind of really show off the glaze. So that's the thing about song ceramics. The main thing is the glaze. That's what you're really showing off. And here's another one. So this one is a really good example of that thing we were talking about with the glaze looking all the one color, but in fact, having lots of variation in it. So from afar, this looks purple, but when you get up close, I can see purples, I can see reds, darker purples. You've got a bit of brown at the bottom with the clay bodies coming through, some blue and even some white. So there's a whole lot happening in there in this one vase. And I think the really simple shape is really showing off those colours. The pot is really just a canvas for this glaze, really. So it's really showing off what all the different chemicals in the glaze are doing. Our next one we're going to look at is rue ware. So here's some rue ware. Very interesting colours here. So again, we've got quite a, a sky colour. It almost looks like ice or glass. 
Very lovely. There's definitely a kind of a pattern happening on there. So let's let's find out a bit about what that is. So Rue Ware is the most famous and most prized of the Song Dynasty ceramics because it was only briefly made. And these other ones, they were kind of made for a long time. But this one was only made for a very short time in um, 1100. So what's that? It's 12th century now. So we're kind of moved on a wee bit. Um, and it's extremely rare. Fewer than 100 whole pieces survive. So to see this, you know, you need to go to a museum or you need to go and see a private collection. You're not just going to stumble across it somewhere. And it, is a, it has a really distinctive duck egg blue glaze, which is said to be like the blue of the sky in a clearing after the rain. And there's a story actually of how this ware was created, because this was the first official ware of the Song Dynasty court. Um, and it said that it was created um, when the emperor had a dream. And in that dream, he saw um, the rain and then the rain went away and it left the blue sky. And from there, he saw the most beautiful vase. And then when he woke up, he was like, right, somebody make it for me. And then they did, you know, it's nice being an emperor like that. You can snap your fingers and it happens. So that's kind of the, a bit of the mythology behind these beautiful ceramics. And again, you've got this lovely simple shape. It's kind of echoing the shape of a lotus, kind of like a water lily, which again is very big in Chinese culture. You've got the gorgeous dimples here. And you can see here there's got a slight crackle in it. You feel it's a crackle in ceramics or crazing, where you kind of got this little network of very fine cracks across it. Here's another piece with that crazing or crackling. You can see it a bit more. You can kind of see it worked in there. And again, you've got this lovely, very minimal shape. You've got a bit of flaring at the top there, coming down into a very thin neck and then coming out into a nice wide belly. Very gorgeous. All right, so this next one is called Gay Wear. Gay Wear? Sorry, I'm sorry about my pronunciation, guys. So you've got this beautiful, very, very shallow plate. And again, with this lovely, very just simple indentation, it's a very simple form. Just very thin, very fine, just a slight little bit of design, nothing too much, nothing too fussy. And it's really showing off this fabulous glaze. So we've got kind of a double crackle happening here. We've got this kind of this dark, these dark lines that are almost black. And then underneath you've got these lovely kind of pale yellow, almost like a net underneath. So let's learn a wee bit about this. So Gayware is made in 1127, so around about the 12th century, and it's a type of celadon um, ceramics. And celadon is kind of a catch-all term for these pieces that are kind of a soft, translucent green, green glaze. Um, it's kind of a family of glazes. It looks a little bit like jade. It's very fine, very thin, sh um, shows light beautifully. And often, again, it has these very simple forms. So it's got a distinctive crackle glaze, often known as the double crackle, which we can see a bit more clearly here. Um, and the phrase that they use to describe it is gold thread and iron wire, which I think is a really lovely phrase. So if you can imagine all these yellow bits are a really fine cobweb of gold, and then over the top you have this thicker, darker iron. And I just, I really love that phrase. It really conjures up an image for me. So the glaze is often cream or ivory, kind of a bit off-white sometimes grey or brown with a little bit of green in it. And we're seeing this kind of green here. I really like it. And the clay that it's made on it isn't a porcelain. It's a darker clay. It's stone, stoneware, which is just different. Um, and it's dark purple. And often that shows through the edges. So we'll see some examples of that now. Here we go. We've got this lovely plate, very fine example of that gold coming through. And then we've got this lovely dark, 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 clay body coming through. So that's the clay where the glaze is kind of pulled away from the edge. You get these lovely dark purple coming through. And this will happen anywhere you have an edge. And um, so here's a lovely, another lovely example. This is one of my favourites and I think a lovely example of kind of the shape really showing off the glaze. So you've got these lovely indents made at the si sides which is showing off this again this purple clay body. Um, which is kind of interwoven with this lovely double crackle. It's a really, really lovely example there, especially with a really orange crackle there. Lovely. Very nice. 
There we go, and here's another one. So this one, this, the shape isn't quite as simple. You're getting a bit more fussy on the handles here. But again, you've got this lovely belly showing off that fabulous double crackle. And then with the rim coming through. And that's really, really nice. So we've got a bit of a contrast here. We're going from Geh wear. And then again, we've got that same shape, but a different glaze. This is Guan wear. So again, a bit, getting a bit more fussy on the handles in the later Song Dynasty. They're getting a little bit, little, little bit less minimal. But this one is more blue. It's got a more blue shining through and it doesn't have that double crackle. It's just got a single crackle. Very nice. So Guan wear is made much later in the Song Dynasty. Again, it's a stoneware, it's not porcelain, so it's that little bit heavier. And the decoration was very much about this crackle, this random crazing. And it's um, more blue or grey than the other ones. And this one is the most frequently copied of all the Chinese wares. People try and forge it a wee bit more. So just be careful if you're antique shopping there, guys. There we go. Here's a really good example here of that lovely blue, that blue and that crackle really showing it off. And I think this, you can see this vase is a little bit heavier than some of the other ones we've seen. It definitely looks thicker. It's not got that fine porcelainness, And just the way it's on the bottom there, it doesn't have a wee foot. It's um, very flat on the ground and that can make it look a bit heavier. So we're, we're kind of moving away from that ultra, ultra refinement. And now, this is something we might be a bit more familiar with. I think if you imagine Chinese ceramics, this might be what would normally pop into your head. So here we go, we've got this classic blue and white that we all know. And you can definitely see the contrast from this. Very fine, very simple, really showing off the glaze. The glaze is the main bit. To this, where it's about the decoration. And you call this underglaze decoration. We're not doing this with the glaze, we're doing this with painting underneath in the underglaze. Now we also, we've got lots of motifs here, we've got a fish, we've got some chrysanthemums, we've got this lovely pattern around here, we're really showing off the drawing and painting there. Lots of very fine details. So where does this come from? So this kind of blue and white started in the Wan Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty which is from 1279, so the 13th century, to 1368, which is the 14th century. So in the 13th century, what's happening? Number one, the Mongol Empire is huge. And in fact, China has been absorbed into the Mongol Empire. They're no longer owned by the kind of traditional Chinese dynasties. They've been taken over by the Mongol Kublai Khan. And the golden age of the, Is of the Islamic Empire is over because of attacks by the Mongols. And then also, in this time, just to give you a bit of historical context, the Battle of Bannockburn was in 1340, so kind of towards the end of the Wan Dynasty, we're getting the Scottish Wars of Independence, so that's kind of about where in our timeline they are. So if you think we're still living in kind of like stone castles, a lot of us are still peasants, and then this is, this is what's happening over in China. And it's also in this time that the Ottoman Empire was established. So, the Mongol Empire brought major stylistic and technical influence from the Islamic world because actually, although we associate this style with China, it actually came from the Islamic world um, who invented this sort of decoration and technique in the 9th century. So, you know, now here we are in the 13th century and this is when it's kind of coming to China. So over in the Islamic world, they have this 4,000 years before. So they invented this kind of underglaze painting um, using cobalt. So cobalt is the mineral that we use um, to do this. It creates this lovely blue colour and that is mined from the ground. Um, so in the Wan Dynasty, um, they started producing these beautiful wares using this underglaze blue from the cobalt. And they also did some with red as well, using copper to create that red. Um, and they kind of, they took this technology and this style from the Islamic world and they took it and they made it uniquely Chinese. So they started to use traditional Chinese motifs of animals and plants. So we've got this lovely chrysanthemum here and we've also got some dragons up the top because we know we love a dragon and also these fish here at the side. So one of the big changes here is the porcelains become thicker, they become heavier, they're a lot 
and they're also a lot bigger. Gone are the days of small, quite minimal, refined tablewares. We're now going for massive, massive vases with lots of decoration on them. And all this. So it's very, very dense. Um, and needless to say, the kind of the older generation, the Song Dynasty, who've been ousted by the Mongols, they were a bit like, ew, look at this gaudy stuff that they've started to make. And they thought they were quite crude. Um, and they were kind of, they yearned for the old days of the beautiful, very fine Song Dynasty pieces. And then pieces like this one that we're looking at here were initially made to export across the Mongol Empire. So they weren't made for domestic use, they were made to sell because the Mong Mongols were very big on trade. Um, and then eventually people were like, we quite like these, we might keep them. Here's another one. And again, you've got this symbol of the horse, which we learned last week was very much um, twinned with the Mongol Empire because, you know, they were originally nomadic people who were very, very deadly on the horse. Um, and they could have, they definitely, that's how they got a lot of the powers because they were such fearsome horseback fighters. So you've got a little bit of that going on there. Um, so yeah, got a bit of a raised bit here. So it's definitely a big, a big, big change from the Song Dynasty to the Wan Dynasty. So here's some more blue wear. So again, you've got this lovely dragon. And then I thought I'd pop this one in here because I thought it was a lovely example of a slightly different kind where you've got um, kind of the dragon done in negative space. So they've left the dragon unglazed, they, give, they put the blue on, and then this dragon is kind of carved in. I just thought it was a really nice example to pop in there. So you can see they're really, really big. And then here's an example of some of those red wares as well. And this would be quite technically difficult to do um, because to get copper to turn red in a kiln, you need to suck all the oxygen, oxygen out of the kiln because Copper, normally, if we were to put some copper in a pot and fire it in a kiln and not suck all the oxygen out, it would turn green. So it's very interesting that they did it with this red way. And we've also got, we've got the motif of the phoenix here, which is very nice. So that kind of makes sense to paint that in red, given it's a fire bird, you know. And now we're moving on to the Ming Dynasty. So that's the thing we're going to be drawing on Friday. We're going to be drawing some Ming vases. And what happened in the Ming Dynasty? So the Ming Dynasty is 1368 to 1644. So a little bit of context about what's happening. So in Europe, well actually in China as well, because China was also, also had a bit of this issue, um, we've just had the Black Death. And the Black Death kind of comes in waves um, towards the end of the Wang Dynasty and into the Ming Dynasty, killing up to a third of the population in Europe. And then also the European, Euro European Renaissance started in the 1300s. So we're kind of around about that point. Um, so the Ming Dynasty is considered to be most of the in most intriguing and complicated times in Chinese history. They've booted out the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire has mostly collapsed and they've got a kind of a traditional Han Chinese person back in power. Uh, but it was a very totalitarian rule, which was extremely conservative. So kind of a lot of the social rules were very, very strict. Uh, but trade boomed, especially in this porcelain, which is why quite often we know the phrase Ming vase. And this is when they were exporting lots of these, when we began to really associate this with China. Um, and people could make lots of money trading. And the new money kind of loosened up the traditional rigid social hierarchy. So it was quite easy for people to make money and kind of bump and climb the social ladder, if you know. So much porcelain was made for export, but the emperor also had pieces made specifically for him, like he always does. Lucky, lucky emperor. So one of the things we're going to look at here is a real, a real change. We're now getting multicoloured decoration. And that is what I really want you to focus on here when we get to the Ming Dynasty. So we've kind of, we've done the no decoration, uh, just the glaze, very simple, very minimal, very elegant. We then moved on to kind of bigger and chunkier and um, blue and white, and blue and white and red. And now we're into the polychromatic, which is a great word, polychromatic meaning many coloured, multicoloured if you will, but it's a nice word. If you want to use that word, off you go, it's a great word. So initially, cobalt, that blue, was the only colour 
that could withstand the high temperature of a porcelain firing without discolouring. Now, because porcelain is a very strong clay, you can fire it to a very high temperature that makes it really, really hard and strong, and that's why you can make it so thin. That's why it's so highly prized. But the issue is a lot of the minerals that you use to create colour don't last when it gets to ha that higher temperature. It's only the blue. But gradually, mostly during the Ming period, other, col other colours were found and the extra cost of a second firing at a lower temperature to fix overglaze enamels was accepted. So this piece that we're looking at here, which is a piece of Wukai ware, has both underglaze and overglaze or enamel decoration. So if you look at it, you see this blue, the blue bits, they're a little bit fuzzier. And we can tell that that's underglaze decoration because when the glaze goes over it, as we talked about earlier, when the glaze heats up, it goes a bit liquidy. And when it's going a bit liquidy, it kind of moves a bit of that pigment around before it settles and hardens as it cools. So you get this kind of, um, a little bit of movement in there. It looks a bit fuzzy, and that's how you can tell it's underglazed. And then once it's been cooled, you then go in with your overglaze and you do all these reds, these yellows, these oranges, these greens, and that is why that detail is a little bit sharper because it hasn't heated up to the point when that glaze is moving around. So the pigment hasn't moved. It's only been it's only been heated enough enough to attach those colours on top, and that's why it's much crisper. So another an example here we've got of oh let me click come on there we go. So this is Dukai ware, and you can tell that this is more underglaze because it's got that fuzzier effect. So you've got the blue, the green and the red, and they've been put on underneath the glaze, and that's why it is fuzzier compared to the Wukai ware, which has got more overglaze, which is crisper. There we go, so that's the difference. Dukai, a bit fuzzy. Wukai, a bit crisper. So here's another piece. So again, we're getting lots of colour, lots of pattern, lots of decoration. It's very, very busy. Big old contrast. This is one of my favourites. I think this is a really lovely piece of Wukai wear. It's got these gorgeous flowers on it, lots of background pattern, very crisp little thin lines. It's lovely. And then here's another one which I just love. You see this lovely dragon with all these fabulous scales painted on its funny little eyes. I just think he's got some really class expressions in here. Looks really great. So you've got this beautiful porcelain that you're now able to have lots of colour on, you're able to have lots of pattern, and you're also able to have lots of detail now, because before it would always be a bit of a trade-off between these things. And it doesn't stop there. We've got this other beautiful piece called Fa Hua, um, and this technique is quite an interesting piece. And you can get it in lots of different colours. Initially, we're going to look here at this blue and yellow type. So Fa Hua, means, um, so Hua apparently means secret, um, and it is because these patterns would look quite secret until you put the glaze on. And that is because they would kind of do two different things. They would do a bit of cutting in, so getting that subtle, subtle design. And then they'd also do a bit of slip trailing. And slip trailing I like to describe as kind of like icing a cake. So you know when you get the little squeezy things and you can write in icing on a cake and it's a little bit 3D, that's a little bit what like what strip slip trailing is. And when you do this, you can kind of fill different areas with glazes and it won't run anywhere. So we kind of that kind of anchors the glaze in so you can do different coloured glazes on the same piece um, and that's how these pieces are created because um, otherwise if you didn't have those raised lines this yellow would be right down at the bottom it would run everywhere so it allowed you to kind of keep these glazes separate and paint a design in glaze rather than under glaze so we've got this beautiful piece here with some clouds and some lovely chrysanthemums we've got a scene here with kind of like a wise sage man and some of his followers some lovely animals and some more flowers. And we've got so just some guys hanging out here. And I particularly, I love the shape of this piece. This is known as a gourd shape. And I really, really like it, I think it's lovely. But again, these are quite big, they're quite chunky. They're, I wouldn't, you wouldn't maybe describe them as elegant. And um, they're, quite, they're quite far from that song wear, but um, they certainly are beautiful, really beautiful gem-like colors. This, this one piece is a bit more refined. 
um, a bit smaller, it's a bit crisper. Um, and again, lovely. So we've got beautiful details of a sea down here. We've got animals, we've got flowers, we've got clouds, you know, there's lots going on in this design. So you've got some more colour here. Here's some lovely green and yellow pieces. These are really nice. So we've got examples here where this is more carving in rather than piping on. Um, and you can see that the glaze is really bringing out some of those details. So here we've got some waves, a wave pattern in the background with some lovely frogs on top. On both of these, we've got some lovely um, dragons. So this is a ginger jar. That's lovely. And this again is a lovely gourd vase. I think these shapes are great. And what you'll notice really about here is there's not much of a foot ring. They very much end on the bottom. This piece here's got a bit of a foot. This one here's got a bit of a foot. But these are quite, oh, they're quite heavy when they hit the ground. They're definitely not elegant and airy. And here I just thought this was a lovely piece. It's got a lovely dragon on it, some lovely yellow and blue. And you just know it's really crisp. There's very little kind of movement in the in the pieces. The glaze isn't running. It's really just a lovely example. And we've come quite a long way. If we think back to that first plate with that with that lovely flower incised. And here we are, we've got this dragon painted on in blue and yellow. It's absolutely packed and it's just such a contrast to that first white plates with just a delicate flower carved in. It's been a real whirlwind of change, both in taste and also in kind of the technology avail available to make these pieces. And then the last pieces we're going to look at are called Jihong wear. So we've got this lovely red here with quite a lot of variation. You've got this kind of pooling at the bottom of the glaze. So Jihong wear. Um, it's called sacrificial red, where with G meaning sacrifice and Hong meaning red. And in traditional Chinese culture, the colour red represents joy, happiness and auspiciousness, which is, uh, you know, pretty good stuff. So we've got joy, happiness and luck. You know, if you offered that to me, yes, I would take it in a heartbeat. So Ji Hong air was made just for the emperor. There are less than 100 Ji Hong porcelain objects in museums worldwide. So not very many. So we've got these lovely, again, very elegant shapes, very thin, all that one colour of glaze, kind of looking like it's harking back to that Song Dynasty stuff. It was extremely hard to produce this kind of porcelain and the success rate was quite low. So that probably explains why they're so few and why they're so very rare. It would require very expensive materials and a very complex firing process to happen. And I know that any of you who have done ceramics will kind of understand how complex that firing process can be and how things can just change without you really realising. So the Emperor Wanzong of the Min Dynasty wanted to use red porcelain to worship the sun god and issued an imperial decree ordering the Jing Din Zen kiln to produce it. After many attempts, the craftsmen failed to produce satisfactory porcelain, which is a shame because you know it's really hard. And they were whipped, thrown in prison and threatened with death if they didn't produce what the emperor desired. Oh, these emperors, man, they're just, they're not chill. Kaylin, daughter of the um, elderly kiln worker, was very upset when her father was jailed. Enraged at the atrocity, she jumped into the fiery kiln. Two days later, when workers opened the kiln, they were surprised to find the porcelain inside was blood red. So that's kind of the, the, the legend behind this um, beautiful ware that would be used for ceremonial purposes that would have been very special and only the emperor would have had some. And there we go and there's another piece and you can kind of see we've almost come full circle here back to that beautiful song refinement. This is a very familiar shape, we've seen that quite a few times. And again, you've got this beautiful glaze. The only decoration is the glaze and kind of that is the key to it. So there you go. Some things change, some things stay the same. And that's the end. So we went all the way from this, which is the Song Dynasty Ru ware in the 10th century, all the way through to the 14th century, where we got this beautiful polychrome porcelain. So thank you very much for watching today everyone i hope you find that a bit interesting especially if you're into ceramics there was quite a bit of change there and quite it was quite an interesting time period to look into so i hope you all have a lovely week and i'll see you next week okay bye